Now, the family and the nation at large of Basutu have paid their last respects to the late chief uh, Mateadira Seiso, the principal chief of the Mutlohong district. Chief Seiso is the sixth generation of the lineage of King Mushweshwe and comes second as a brother to the late King Mushweshwe II. His Majesty King Litsia III says that his uncle was his pillar and a great advisor to him. Well, somebody who's been following that story for us is uh, uh, Rapelang Khadebe, who joins us now uh, via Zoom for a little bit more on this. Rapelang, thanks very much indeed for joining us. Datendoro, Happy New Year and a good day to you. Happy New Year to you. Um, tell us about uh, uh, this sad story, this uh, passing, and how Basutu have been responding. Indeed, he, he remains one of the greatest stalwarts from the lineage, you know, of the who comes after King Mushashe II as a second brother. And some explain or, or they say he is one of the few that actually gets the traits uh, of the founder of Basutu King, uh, his soft-spokenness, but very tough, um, and it was the principal chief of Mohotlo. Mohotlo is one of the richest districts, they say, in Lesotho, and he he just led an exemplary life. Um, Basutu paid their tributes remembering him for his kindness. Uh, he also played an instrumental role when um, King Mushesha, his brother, uh, was exiled by the then regime of the military uh, that had taken over at the time and sent him exile overseas. And he was quite instrumental in his return to be reinstated mm. back as the king. And uh, he's an uncle to King Litsia III, and uh, he's uh, saddened by this as well. Greatly so. You, you, the, His Majesty, you look at him, he was really in tears. In fact, many other speakers who spoke uh, showing how a true exemplary leader, uh, a, a king that, the chief that actually put him, his people before himself uh, in developing and understanding in dispute resolutions when it comes to some of the toughest um, disputes in, in the districts, you will know that this is where we get our um, water, the, the Highlands Water Scheme. This is where concentration of the diamond minings are. And it, it remains one of the poorest districts in terms of economic activity, yet it possesses the great wealthness. And he has sat in many disputes, but they say it is his demeanor his very kindness and very soft-spokenness that always found a solution given in the complex of most problems. I know that he had retired from public uh, duty and public life, uh, and I guess age was catching up with him. Oh, yes, indeed. I think he, 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 he lived a full life, uh, quite active, and I think about two, three years, he, he handed over the reins to his son uh, to be acting because he was really becoming quite weary. And you, you would see His Majesty the King taking, often taking trips to go and see him in person. And I suppose even to get the last of his advice from his counsel. Uh, he was quite experienced indeed. And so I think his old age was catching up with him and, and really becoming a bit weary. So he handed over power. I, we, we understand now, I think, the king will now gazette his son, uh, who is the last born, to actually take over his reigns in that particular district. How influential are people of this ilk? And that influence and that reverence gets passed down to the son, but I suppose in many ways he also had his own identity even though he occupied this uh, position of authority and trust. V very much for, I think you believe he's the last of those who possesses uh, a mixture of both leadership schemes. Those who know him says he was a bodybuilder, 
he, he was a boxer where he went to school and, and he had funny stories. Others would say he was somebody who would listen very carefully and, and tend to pass jokes so much. He would just whisper to somebody next to him and say, he, he would call people by names. He would just come up with random names if he does not really uh, grab what you are, the point you're trying to make because he was now in the Senate. So the mixture of leadership that has the, the funny bone in him, I would say, but being very stern, he spoke quite softly. But most of the time, people felt very comfortably in talking to him, uh, and he would listen to anyone. There, there is one guy who said he just took him under his armpit and has been mentoring him through. And, and he had no business really to do that, but he was just interested in how he did things. Remember, he was one of the few who actually was sent to maximum prison during the the, re, the regime of when the military took over, uh, and he was sentenced to maximum people for quite maximum prison for quite some time uh, because he insisted that he wanted to put his nation first, and sometimes was very active in saying things that did not really please or go with the then regime at the time. I'm told that mourners uh, described him as an upright chief. What did that mean? You, you are right. Just his demeanor. Uh, he was a very well dressed. Uh, he dressed properly and commanded great respect. Uh, he was trained in Oxford, I think, in public administration. So a mixture of understanding the culture and the demeanor of Basutu and his command, I think, in the language and his well-trained demeanor when it comes to leadership, I, I think the, the combination of the two gave him a great command when he, his mm -hmm. approach to things. That, that, that is why I think you see that his king was really very close to him and he sought guidance in many mm -hmm. complex situations. Uh, so to understanding the, the tribulation that it has gone to, he, he became that center uh, that when he spoke, even those who were on opposing sides they really stood and pulled back to listen because mostly he would have the counsel, great wisdom that came out of him. It's a fascinating life that he led. I'm told that at one point he was sent as far afield as Israel to learn issues of governance. He, 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 he was one of those very well endowed. You know, coming from the Barakwa tribe um, uh, in the Mohoton district, very close to the KwaZulu Natal area, a great influential district. So he, 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 he was one of those, when it comes to dispute um, resolutions, they really looked up to him and he, he wanted to really learn widely when it comes to issues of, of of dispute resolutions and understanding. So yes, you are absolutely mm -hmm. right. For for many of the very complex meetings, he many really depended mm -hmm. on him for his wisdom. Uh, that is why he commanded such respect. Very soft spoken, but when he speaks, um, everybody would pull back and really want to grab the best of what he has to say. When somebody of this stature passes on, um, legacy is something that people start to look upon and I just wonder what do you think might be uh, the, his legacy that he leaves behind? You're absolutely right Peter. It, it actually sparked a little bit of a, a debate because the Speaker of Parliament uh, actually came out and says he, he's the last of the real uh, sort of chiefs that we have known and we wonder whether there can be anyone who takes after him. And the chief of, the principal, the chief of Tavabusiu was very quick to say, look, this is a man who spent his time training, mentoring us. And he said, now that he has passed on, you are going to see uh, the real results of what he was capable of, his training, and his passing on of the wisdom. And, and he said his legacy will be seen and reflected in some of us.
All right, Rappelang, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so, so much indeed uh, for giving us some insights on uh, the stature and the nature of uh, this man that uh, is being uh, uh, laid to rest and uh, uh, being paid respect to. Thank you so much.